Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Spiritual Wanderlust podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Deutsch. And I have really been looking forward to today's conversation with a woman whose work feels deeply resonant with the spirit of the times. Those of you who know her are familiar with her several books on Celtic spirituality and creativity and a variety of practices. But those of you who haven't met her are in for a treat. Today, we welcome Christine Walters Paintner to the Spiritual Wanderlust podcast. Christine is the abbess of an online monastery called the Abbey of the Arts, which offers classes and resources on contemplative practice and creative expression. A poet, a spiritual director, and a part-time hermit, she now resi resides in Galway, Ireland with her husband, John. Her several books include Earth, Our Original Monastery, The Artist Rule, The Soul's Slow Ripening, the Wisdom of the Body, and her latest, The Birthing of the Holy. Welcome, Christine. We're so happy to have you. Thank you, Kelly. It's delightful to be with you. Wonderful. Well, to start us off, you are an abbess of an online monastery, which is a rather unusual title. Can you tell us how this came about and what that means? Yeah, I sometimes joke that that wasn't like one of my college, you know, career choices to sign up for. Um, yeah, it happened. I was in graduate school, uh, gosh, almost 20 years ago, I guess, and studying uh, studying monasticism was part of it. I actually fell in love with monasticism through my graduate studies. The graduate studies mm. does have some, some uh, doorways into pleasure and, and joy, and fell in love with Benedict mm. and the Benedictine rule and Hildegard of Bingen and all of those, you know, wonderful um, practices and people. And I uh, became drawn towards becoming a Benedictine oblate, mm. which, uh, so I was doing graduate work in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, in Berkeley. And then we moved up to Seattle, my husband and I, and I became an oblate of St. Placid Priory, which is about an hour from Seattle and uh, is a Benedictine monastery of a community of women and Sister Lucy there became a wonderful kind of friend and mentor and great support of my work and promptly got me leading retreats there and all of that hmm. and yeah it just kind of evolved from there it took you know I mean those were sort of like the early days of online teaching I taught a course for a seminary that was part of the doorway into uh, for the Episcopal Seminary at the Graduate Theological Union on Benedictine mm -hmm. spirituality. And I wasn't, honestly, wasn't convinced that teaching online would be as satisfying as teaching in person. And I ended up loving it. So that was kind of the impetus, I guess. And I was pretty comfortable with online technology. So we started up a website and decided it would be a virtual monastery because that's what my, you know, my love was, and we call it Abbey of the Arts because my two kind of great passions are the contemplative practice and giving people those traditions and roots and then creative expression, particularly as grounded in the the kind of practice of what's called expressive arts, which is kind of a more therapeutic approach and really looks at kind of nurturing creative process over product. Mm, and so mm -hmm. those things kind of all came together in the spiritual monastery and to my delight and joy there were all kinds of other artists and monks out there in the world who had this very specific passion for these things how these things come together and yeah I'm just delighted and it's, so we've been doing this for 15 years I say we because my husband uh, once we moved to Ireland, started to work with me. When we were living in Seattle, he was teaching high school the <laughs> theology, and um, he was kind of ready for a break from that. So now we now we partner together in the work. So that's awesome. I, yeah. I love when I first encountered your Facebook group, the Holy Disorder of Dancing Monks. I immediately was like, okay, I need to <laughs> I need to be a part of this because this sounds so perfect. Like the, I feel like that's. Um, a, a theme both in your work and in in Celtic spirituality is almost a, like a wink, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that happens through a lot of writings and just the, um, I don't know, the way of viewing the world, like that there's a playfulness to it. Yeah. Where do you yeah. think that comes from? Uh, I think, well, I just, I have a love of, you know, working with the imagination, working with intuition, 
mm-hmm. kind of working with what I would call like the, you know, the sacred feminine. Um, really, I find that contemplative practice really nurtures and nourishes a way of being that's slow and spacious and mm. makes room for the spirit to erupt in ways that are disruptive and playful sometimes. And, you know, mm-hmm. I, I just, I also think that, you know, part of Benedictine spirituality is very much uh, emphasis on humility and humility mm. kind of has a weird uh, ring to it, I think, in our modern world. But for me, it's really about being earthy. And of course, humility and humor have mm-hmm. the same root uh, in hummus or earth. So mm-hmm. this sense for me about not taking myself too seriously. It was several years ago, actually, it was just when I was moving from Seattle to to Europe, and I led this retreat. And it was a, a creativity, dancing and writing retreat. And that was where the disorder um idea came in because we were having this conversation and and I realized we're not an order we're a disorder (laughs) and I would much prefer I'm not really particularly interested in rules and you know dogmas and telling people what to think and all of that I'm much more interested in giving people practices and inviting them into a way of embodiment that works for them in their own lives and so yeah so part of that is not taking ourselves too seriously I love Mm -hmm. that So Benedictine spirituality is a huge influence and stream in your own life, but so is Celtic. And Mm -hmm. I'm curious where that came about. Well, my husband and I um, visited Ireland for the first time in 2007 together. And I, we were here for three weeks and I just, I fell in love with the place. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I don't have any Irish ancestors myself. My husband does on half of his side and and yet I feel so much more kind of alive and connected here than I do, mm. say, in the UK, where half my ancestry comes from. And and part of it at the time I was reading that the book, um, oh, by Thomas Cahill, How the Irish Saved Civilization, mm. while I was uh, on that trip. And, you know, it made me it made me angry at, a bit at the Roman church and, you know, the kind of imposition of order that it talks mm-hmm. about. And, but it also made me really appreciate how these Irish monks had their own sort of indigenous organic sort of way of practicing mm-hmm. um, spirituality and monasticism that was, yeah, that just felt much more aligned, much more connected to the natural world, a lot of alignment towards the pre-Christian pagan practices There's all these gorgeous stories of um, saints who have this intimacy with animals, which I just, I adore those stories because for me, it's about celebrating this, this idea that holiness comes from an intimacy and cherishing of creation. Mm. And that, that those stories are such a direct window into that. And the Celtic monks were so deeply influenced by desert spirituality. And that would be the other thread for me that, really speaks to my heart and that I bring into a lot of the work that I do. And, and so, yeah, to see how the Irish monks, you know, there are so many places in Ireland that have the word desert, desert, or desert, or desert, not my Irish is not very good, but in the actual place name. And it's so funny because here in Ireland, of course, you know, it's like the Northwest, it's gushing rain all the time, most of the time. So there isn't really any literal desert, but those that metaphorical space of seeking the solitude and the wilderness and that radical encounter with the divine was very much, you know, they very much resonated with that, yes. that tradition. So all of those threads together just, yeah. And, and you know, then we, we moved to Europe and we actually moved to Austria first for six months because that's where my father was from and I have an Austrian passport so that facilitated all the practical sides of things but the immigration process was very challenging for my husband so we always said Ireland was plan b so to speak so we came to Ireland and it's worked out really really well for us and we really do love it here Mm. and you know within an hour's drive there's dozens of these sacred sites both the Christian sites as well as you know the kind of kelp kind of pre-Christian sites and the uh, neolithic and megalithic sites and and just this amazing history in in stone, you know, that exists here. And 
yeah and and their stories connected to all the parts of the land it's it's a place really unlike any other that I've lived. Now I'm sure in Seattle that the indigenous people have the that similar tradition of the stories of the places, but of course, you know, as a white person I don't have as much access to that. And here it's it feels much more like alive and mm. for me and integrated into the culture and yeah, there's still, even all the place names. If you look back to what the Irish name, because a lot of the place names are anglicized, um, but if you look at the Irish names, um, you know you can sort of see get a, like a glimpse of the story of the place. And, and there's a big movement here to reclaim the Irish language, which is really exciting to to witness as well. Yes, so. yes, I love to see the resurgence of of interest in the Celtic and the contemplative and the mystical like that is really having a moment and I I love that because I feel like it's I mean at least in the tradi Christian tradition is one of the best kept secrets you know <laughs> that that this tradition mm -hmm. even exists so I'm very excited that that people are discovering it and finding something that is um, very heart-centered embodied earthy you know it's the light bulb yeah yeah I feel like it offers such a good alternative to our kind of dominant way of thinking which is very linear and planning minded and doing and the Irish the Irish way of being is not linear at all <laughs> and and I love that I find it frustrating at times for sure um but as someone who does tend to have a fairly orderly way of thinking about things but I love that it disrupts that for me and um, you know, there's a playfulness here and, a, you know, all of that kind of mischievous sort of side to the Irish too. Yes. And I, I really enjoy all that. Yeah. You know? Yes. Mm -hmm. It is really helpful to have a culture around you that is disrupting the more Western linear, you know, planning success minded. I mean, I, I yeah. found that too, when I was living in Italy, you know, they were like, if you get one thing done during the day, feel good about it <laughs> you know because <laughs> normally we'd be like okay gotta go to the post office gotta go grocery shopping yep. I gotta run it you know and they're like no, no, no that's just not how it works here <laughs> yeah slow yeah. down con calma you know? lovely lovely yeah. yeah yeah so beautiful I wanted to spend some time today talking about your book is that all right birthing yeah. the holy great so this book is all about 31 titles of Mary and when I shared this with my husband, who is not Catholic, he was like, I didn't know she had so many titles. <laughs> like, so before we get into the content of the book, why does Mary have so many titles? <laughs> That's a great question. And, and I could have written, you know, about, you know, 60 or 100 names of Mary. I had to choose, you know, and it was basically the ones that most resonated with me. And, um, you know, kind of, I mean, Jesus also, you know, goes by many names and certainly God goes by many names. And so I think that there's something about our hunger for a connection to the sacred in all of its different facets mm -hmm. that then, you know, we resonate with Mary, you know, as, um, you know, as the queen, as the virgin, as the star of the sea, you know, as the mirror of justice. And it's, it's this, be I think it's this beautiful sense of, well, for me, it comes from kind of the Jungian work around archetypes and how we embody within us all these different facets of our being. We are each a multitude. We aren't just one thing. And so there's a way for me in which um, exploring and embracing all these different facets of, say, Mary has helps me to get in touch with those parts of myself as well especially the parts that maybe I have more difficulty embracing or mm. resist or need a little more support with um, as well as the ones that I I love and then she helps me celebrate that that aspect uh but yeah they I mean they just it's just sort of one of those things that evolved over time you know I give a little history for most of the titles and you know, it's not like there was a council early on that decided these are the names. It just, a lot of the names just emer emerge out of specific traditions or specific places or specific encounters and just over time then become part of the, yeah, part of the beautiful tradition 
and poetry really of who mm -hmm. of who Mary symbolizes. Yes. I love how you do that in the book. It's almost a um, Lexio practice with each of her titles and um, reflecting upon that, that archetype. Like what does this title mean for us? Like, it's cool that Mary is the star of the sea, but what does that even mean? <laughs> and mm -hmm. how do we, um, how do we not only call upon her, but also um, live into that same um, presence that she brings to us. So I, I really enjoyed how you did that in the book. Mm, um, thank you. Yeah, I I also love how you bring in the Jungian into your work. And I'm curious, I mean, there are people who are listening who also are, just love the Jungian and archetypes and all of that, but there are also listeners who are not that familiar with the Jungian and might not be sure, like, how does that intersect with, you know, your your spirituality? What does that mean? Yeah, well, um, yeah, it's a, it's such a rich place for, you know, deepening self-knowing and deep and greater freedom for being present to others and the holy. And essentially Jung, I mean, there's lots of layers to his teaching, but, you know, what kind of one of the foundational things was this idea of the, the unconscious that each of us you know, if you think about like a little tip of an iceberg coming out of an ocean, that little tip of the iceberg is what we're actually conscious of and everything beneath the surface is what we're unconscious of. And, you know, why should we, why should we care about that? And, but the th idea is that we have, um, again, this kind of wealth of different aspects to ourselves, different dreams, different desires, uh, Jung does a lot of teaching around the shadow, which I think is extraordinarily helpful for anybody to work on to do some shadow work. But I think especially people who are quote unquote spiritual, um, you know, there's a whole, I, I find very kind of invigorating this whole teaching that's come out in the last few years around what spiritual bypassing is when we, when we, um, you know, use religion and spiritual practices and truths to only uplift what is light and good and you know all of those kinds of value judgments that we make and for me um you know and a part of this connects back to benedictine spirituality this idea of radical hospitality or benedict mm. says to welcome the stranger at the door as the very face of christ and i think that's such an extraordinarily beautiful image because it's like not not the thing that you love the most or the thing that you most resonate with it's the, the stranger the thing that feels most disruptive or most foreign or most disorienting and those qualities are all often part of our own shadow selves mm -hmm. so they're all the things in us that we have suppressed a lot for very good reason maybe for survival skills when we were children maybe we were told not to be a certain way and we might have gotten punished if we did you know act that way but then as we get older and particularly um, midlife you know these things start to we start to you know maybe they start to disrupt our lives a little bit and that's I think kind of where that whole idea of like a midlife crisis comes from is that all of a sudden we're in touch with maybe some of these desires in our life that we have suppressed for a long time and mm. I think that the first you know half of our lives we spend a lot of our time about cultivating our persona and our achievements and so forth and so we become quite identified with mm -hmm. certain faces that we show to the world and then when these other parts of ourselves start bubbling up it can be really threatening or disorienting to think oh mm -hmm. you know I I didn't you know I what what happens if I follow this particular thread you know what will it upend in my life will I have to change my career or my relationship or whatever yeah. usually usually there is a demand from it and Jung also said there's the golden shadow which are also the qual so these qualities are not necessarily negative quote unquote they're but they're anything that are suppressed and the golden shadow are particularly the those qualities those really kind of radiant qualities in us that we then project onto other people and so you know if we idolize somebody or you know lift them up beyond their kind of status or whatever that we are probably projecting and that's so the, 
a couple of the key ways that Jung would say that we get in touch with the shadow material. One is dream work and the, the shadow is often, you yeah. know, comes forth in dreams. And then oh, he talks a lot about projection, which is essentially, I talk about it where, you know, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of people in the world who are annoying and, you know, just generally annoying, but there's some annoying people who really get under our skin and like, they're really just like, we can't like let go of a conversation or whatever it is. And it's those, those things that hook us that are a good clue. It doesn't mean that they're not genuinely annoying or unethical or whatever, lack integrity, but it also has a potential to reveal to us something that we might be struggling with. So all of those things I think are really rich food for the spiritual life because we're not about contemplative practice isn't about meditating into a space of inner bliss and transcending life. It's about really being present. You know, the desert mothers and fathers would have been very much about wrestling with, you know, what they called the inner demons and sort of basically the vices of, of tradition and, and, um, you know, how to work with those things so that we can then become more free, ultimately, to grow in love of ourselves, our neighbor and and the divine. So ultimately, it's all, all in, in service of love. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I love how so many of the mystics of people, also the Jungians, um, tie that together so nicely of, of the interior life being one with the exterior it's kind of like you know the the systole and diastole of your heart you know it's like Mm. it goes out and in and in and out and it has to be that rhythm otherwise I mean if you don't have that rhythm that we call that dead (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. and so I I love the the grappling the wrestling and both shadow work and I love my favorite way to do shadow work is through IFS internal family systems and I just that idea of hospitality of welcoming those parts of you. And like you said, it could be the more, the more positive, the golden shadow, or it can be Mm -hmm. things that are more difficult, you know, like our anger, but it could also be our playfulness, you know, that we've repressed and don't allow ourselves to just let loose a little bit. And it is a lot of work that I think saints and mystics in the past would have just called virtue, (laughs) you know, and we're like, this is just another way of doing that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I work a lot with, you know, people in ministry and a lot of pastors and spiritual directors. And I find, you know, that when you're in that kind of work, you know, there is like a certain persona that's very tied into that. And so it's, it can be challenging both to be the one who's the like, asks for help or the recipient of help, because often they're the caretakers mm. or, or that, you know, can show a, either a playful side or a rebellious side or a side that doesn't feel as congruent to the, our image of what, you know, a mm. minister mm. should be. I mean, and this is true, I think for any, any kind of identity that we hold, but that's the one that I, I tend to see a lot, you know, how do we, how do we free ourselves up from from that hold that it might have on us. Yes, absolutely. I, I wanted to ask about a couple of titles of Mary that you wrote about. Um, one that stuck out to me was that of Mary as warrior. And you use the image of the scapular, not as a defense against evil, like some um, Catholics in the more traditional strains might have um, perceived it as, but more like a defense against your boundaries being encroached. And I don't think many of us have heard Mary spoken of in this way. So in your mind, what does it mean to see the sacred mother as warrior? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love, um, I love that warrior archetype in part because it's probably one that I wrestle with a lot, you know, and I think again, like anybody who's in like spiritual teaching or ministry, you know, that that sort of warrior might feel a little bit challenging because we're often peacemakers and people trying to kind of create harmony and all of that. Mm. And yet, and (laughs) yet they're, you know, the warrior part of ourselves is the part that is willing to be fierce to defend something of value. Uh, And I certainly, you know, find Mary in that. And I love that image of Mary as protect 
protectress and her cloak, you know, that she gathers around people to help create these boundaries. And I think, I know for me, part of my own journey for a few years was, was learning to create some of those more energetic boundaries because, you know, again, as, as someone in service, you know, there's an inclination to say yes a lot to people's invitations and, you know, to things that are asked of you. And, and I really had to learn how no was as sacred of a word as yes. And that um, if I really wanted to cultivate uh, a really true contemplative life to the degree that I actually need to thrive <laughs> and to be able to see that that my thriving was part of the service that mm. you know for me to be to be a teacher of these practices it's really only um it's really only a kind of a helpful life-giving thing if i'm being deeply nourished by it like if i'm feeling stretched thin or exhausted or depleted I'm not embodying what it is that I actually want to teach others. And it seems kind of obvious, but it's also a really hard thing to do and to practice, which is part of why I teach it, because it is so hard to do. Uh, and so for uh, for several years, I, I had a work, I mean, I still work on the cultivating of boundaries, but now I have more practices that are a part of that. And calling on Mary is definitely a piece of that and all kind of the different spiritual beings for me that help embody that sort of sense of energetic protection so it's both like against people who might wish me harm mm. but it's also a protection of you know if I feel like there are a lot of demands being made on me that sometimes you know it, particularly running you know my own monastery my identity can be very tied up in the work and so having finding a way to kind of create a little bit of a boundary between myself and the work has been helpful so that I'm not consumed by it because I love what I do but and you know I also need rest and I need to step back from it sometimes and so all those things Mary can be can be one of the you know archetypes that helps us to to um yeah create the, that sense of healthy boundary for ourselves Yes, I think that's incredibly important for any human being, but I think especially for those who are in some sort of ministry, spiritual direction, caregiving role, it's so easy to um, want to give and give and give and uh, burn ourselves out or end up fostering some sort of resentment or, um, I mean, I, I know yeah. after, um, so I was in a religious community in Rome for several years and um, after I, my health fell apart and I came back to the U S and that was such a, um, <laughs> an immersion class in, in how to say no, how to set boundaries. Like I, I didn't really have that in my vocabulary before, but the sacredness of a no, something I had to learn very quickly because my body just wouldn't allow it. You know, they're like, all right, it's time to learn this and real fast. Um, and I find that's true for many people. Like it's something that life kind of forces them to learn if you didn't previously. Yeah. Yeah. That can definitely be one of the invitations of illness for sure. <laughs> yeah, I've experienced a lot of that in my, my life as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I have like four questions floating in my head. Um, <laughs> let's, I'm curious, you, you mentioned and share as much or as little as you want, but um, you mentioned that the passing of your mother was something that partially inspired this book. And I'm curious if you would be open to sharing a little bit about that story, how losing your own mother led you to write a book about Mary. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I was 33 years old and I had just moved from the Bay Area to Seattle. And my mother, um, she had uh, rheumatoid arthritis for a lot of her adult life. I also have that same illness. Uh, but at the time, the medications weren't so great, and they really wore her body down. And mm -hmm. she had been in the hospital with a bone infection for about 12 weeks in the summer. And then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. and she went home for a little while. And then all of a sudden, in October, her system got overwhelmed, and she went into the ICU. And 
they I was called and I flew she was living in Sacramento at the time and I flew down there to be with her and it was and I'm an only child so uh it was up to me to have to make the decision to take her off life support and Mm. it was it was excruciating in a lot of ways and I was very close to my mom and it was really kind of my father had died a few years before but that was Mm. actually kind of a relief in my life and so it was yeah it was a very painful grieving process and there were a lot of layers to it and part of it was you know my mother was kind of coming into her own. I mean, she was 60 years old, but she was finally coming in, I think, into like that crone stage of her life and the fierceness. She um, used a wheelchair and she would uh, lobby for disability rights. And, you know, she just really come into her own power. And I so Mm -hmm. grieved not having the chance to witness her grow into that and have Mm -hmm. a model for that. Plus just the the heartache of, you know, I grieved for a good couple of years, pretty, pretty hard. And, and someone in along that grieving process said, you know, part of this journey for you will be rediscovering what mother means for you now. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, and Mary up until then, I had been, you know, I, I liked Mary. I didn't have any objections to Mary, but, you know, she's often so depicted as this very docile, you know, white woman in a blue dress. And she looks always very peaceful and serene. And, and, you know, I started to discover that there were more faces to Mary and, and it became pretty, um, yeah, empowering and comforting. And, you know, Mary, Mary, who held the body of her, you know, grown son in her arms, who, you know, had been murdered and, you know, just to feel that kinship to her Mm -hmm. as a presence, as an embodiment of that sacred feminine um, that we don't have as explicitly in the Christian tradition. I mean, it's there everywhere. It's just (laughs) lifting it up. And then, yeah, so when I moved to Europe, when I moved to Austria first, I started to have an encounter with the Black Madonna in particular, mm-hmm. and there's a Black Madonna near Vienna, and there was a whole series of synchronicities and dreams and things that brought me to her, and it became this yeah, amazing journey, and then a few years later, I went to Chartres to do a teacher retreat for the Very Task people, and then Ave Maria Press said, would you like to write a book about Mary? And I was like, yeah, sign me up, but I'm oh, yeah. ready. <laughs> Yeah, that's beautiful. I um, I was talking with a friend of mine who is um, grew up Pentecostal evangelical, mm-hmm. and he's really you know he's left that tradition, but you know is feels like he's haunted by Mary. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> like I love how that that um, whether it's specifically you know Mary, the mother of Jesus, or this um, kind of image of this sacred mother is, is really having also a resurgence now that so many people are, um, craving this, this feminine presence. Um, and so, like you said, being able to lift it up, like it's, it's there, it's just (laughs) needing to, um, make space Mm -hmm. for for that, for the feminine. And Mary, you know, who's the one who fights for justice and, you know, the whole Magnificat about, you know, lifting up the poor and it's, it's really beautiful and powerful. And so, yeah, it's very exciting to see so yes. many people welcoming that. Yes. I saw a um, image and I wish I could remember the artist. There's an image um, that someone created of Mary and it has like the Magnificat written around her and she's like crushing the snake, you know, like Mary, the warrior. It was, it was such a lovely image, you know, a kind of counter image to that docile, <laughs> like mm-hmm. praying white Mary. Um, yeah. So I love being able to, to welcome those aspects of her and of us as well. Um, what would you say, which title of Mary speaks to you most in this present chapter of life? Mm. That's a great question. I I think um, Our Lady of the Underworld mm. uh, has been calling to me a lot. She's the mm. one of the Black Madonnas at Chartres Cathedral. She she lives down in the crypt there, Notre Dame Souterre. And uh, I have a love of part of what, what I love teaching about too is 
um, kind of the dark night journey and the mm. underworld journey and the midwinter journey. And, and certainly when my mother died, that was a big part of my own learning and process and integration. And I'd say in the last couple of years, I've entered into menopause and it's, it's also an underworld journey, but in a different way. So there's, there's grieving, but it's not quite like the acute loss of my mother, but it's, there's like all this disruption happening in me. And, and I've also learned a lot about how to be present in those mm-hmm. moments of uncertainty. So there's, I feel like there's a lot of mm-hmm. securities being stripped away and I've been having a lot of health issues. And so I think it's, it's like this entering into the underworld again, but this time, you know, the, the story of Persephone, uh, I, I love that story in part because she's abducted into the underworld and how often we feel, you know, when we, we feel victim to life circumstances, Mm -hmm. but in that story, she's, um, you know, she eats the pomegranate seeds. And in some of the versions of the story, it says she's tricked into it. But I prefer the stories that say that she actually ate them intentionally, because what it means for me is that she, and and by eating them, she has to stay in the underworld half the year, which is how we have the seasons. But she becomes queen of the underworld. So there is a transformation for her of moving from victim to queen and into her Mm. sovereignty and becoming the one who then welcomes in others into the underworld. And so anyway, I feel like in this season of my life, I'm maybe even learning some more aspects of what that underworld journey is about and, you know, experiencing it in a, in a different way. And yeah, yeah. And it's hard to describe because it's a lot of it is about things that I don't actually have a lot of words for, you know, Mm -hmm. but it's, just making space for, I know there's some movement that's working its way through me. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I feel that <laughs> the, I, there's so much um, to be learned from living in those liminal spaces in uncertainty yeah. and um, the, the big crises, life changes, loss, mm-hmm. all of those can usher us into the underworld and, and health I find is a big one. And I know that's part of your experience um, and mine of, of living through chronic illness and just not knowing, you know, like when, yeah. when I'm going to have a good day or not so good day and um, trying to maintain that contemplative or even Marian stance of receptivity before that. And just saying like fiat, like may it be mm-hmm. done. May it be so is so hard when when it can be so painful, you know, um, Mm -hmm. having to, um, say no to things when we don't want to say no, um, or you don't want to let people down or, you know, there's just so many aspects tied up with that. And so uh, for me, that image of um, our lady of the underworld is, is such a big part of learning how to relax that muscle in, in receptivity during the, the liminal, the uncertainty, the, the darkness, the, the winter. And that's mm-hmm. hard. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. And I feel like for all the, you know, all the reading and the study I've done and all the experience I've had with it, it doesn't make it any easier. It does. I do feel like I have, I, I'm, I'm able to accept it in a way that I wasn't able to the first time I went through it with my mom, because it was a new experience to me. And it was such a a loss. And I fought back a lot more. And I, and I actually think fighting back is part of the process too. I'm not saying that sometimes that's not called for <laughs> some good, some good lament, but at the same time, yeah, I'm, I also feel like I have a really deep trust of mm-hmm of whatever it is that will eventually emerge and trying not to have a a timeline around that because gosh, who knows how long it'll be, you know, and I'm sure it'll be the kind of thing that unfolds slowly over time, you know, where I'll have new insights around, you know, how I'm meant to be in this world and both in terms of my work, as well as just my prayer life and my 
yeah, my commitments and mm-hmm. all of those things. Yeah. Yes. That, that trust is such a gift. I, when I came home from Rome with severe illness, um, the image that came to me and I kind of clung to, I felt like I was, um, <laughs> like I had been on some sort of battlefield, but my like chest had been blown open and I needed emergency open heart surgery, you know? And it was like the most excruciating thing that I had ever been through, but it's like the divine surgeon was there and mm-hmm. I knew he was doing something important. Like he was saving my life <laughs> mm-hmm. and I couldn't quite express how, but I knew that it was very important. It was going to hurt like hell. And I needed to hang on to Mary's hand <laughs> through that to get through you know, how difficult and sometimes scary that underworld place can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. When I first moved to Austria and I had that first encounter with the Black Madonna, it was uh, with uh, Our Lady of the Cell, Maria Mm Cell in Austria. And that was a different kind of um, experience with Mary. But one of the things that became significant in that was Mary, that Mary is holding a pear and many of the Marys are either holding pears or made of pear wood. And the pear became this beautiful symbol for me of, of abundance and Mm -hmm. of, you know, letting go of my striving and my reaching and, Mm -hmm. and letting myself be nourished. And I think that's part. So there's a, there's a real sweetness to this underworld time of learning to let go even more like I, I I you know I had this encounter with her with the pair about 10 years ago and it's been an ongoing thing I feel like I keep learning and now that I'm in the underworld I do feel like I also have the, you know the sweetness of that fruit still to nourish me and mm. so <laughs> yeah it's been that's a lovely, lovely trip yeah yeah one more question for you before we wrap up today Um, another title that you talk about, um, of Mary is that of the greenest branch, which is a title that, that Hildegard loved. And it, it really intertwined with her ideas of the greening power of God, that vitality or veriditas. Um, and in a short time, you'll be teaching a class on Hildegard and the women mystic school. And I was curious if you could just share a brief bit about veriditas, what it meant to Hildegard and how that ties in with Mary. Yeah, yeah. The Veriditas is this greening power of God, and it's a word that Hildegard created. And for her, it was this um, physical, spiritual, emotional, like multi-level um, way of attuning to the work of of the divine in the world. And So, you know, and and I've been to the Rhine Valley where Hildegard walked many, many times now and, you know, it is such a green and lush place Mm -hmm. and you imagine Hildegard out in the vineyards and, you know, celebrating this creator who, you know, brings forth all this greening. But then for her, the greening of the soul was the kind of reflection or the other part of the greening of the body. And she was, you know, she was a herbalist and she was very concerned with, kind of that holistic sense of um, of the healing of ourselves, body and, and spirit. And then for her, the basically the virtues, Mary, Jesus, the divine, the angels, they are also all embodiments of mm-hmm. this greening power of God. So they are mm-hmm. kind of the, the fu- like if we want to know what the fullness of that greening is, because as human beings, you know, we only have so much access to it. And um, and so Mary, we can call on Mary, and of course, you know, in one of her songs, "O Viridissima Virga, O Greenest Branch," you know, she depicts mm-hmm. Mary has this. You know, for her, Mary is really a significant figure as well. For her, Mary is is the doorway to Christ, to mm-hmm. the the birth of Christ and the presence. Um, but yeah, I love that image of greening, and we'll definitely be working with that a lot in the in the program that we're, that I'll be doing for you. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm very excited. And uh, if people want to join us, I mean, feel free to sign up at womenmystics.org. We're looking forward to um, another wonderful class um, and exploring all of these female mystics and their feminine strengths and incredible stories. I Hildegard just blows my mind. She was such a, I mean, a pre-Renaissance woman. She just did everything. <laughs> 
you know, like music, she medicine, is. herbs. I mean, and she had chronic illness her whole life too. So I don't know how she did it, but anyway, it's funny because, you know, a lot of the, the people, a lot of people have studied her. I think, you know, she maybe suffered with chronic migraines, which would ex they think explain her visions. I have chronic migraines and I've never had visions like she has. So <laughs> it's be a little yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, Christine, if people want to learn more about you, your work, the Abbey, where should they go? Our website is abbeyofthearts.com and we have a newsletter and we have prayer cycles. We have this a lovely free resource with audio podcasts for morning and evening prayer. One of the weeks is on Mary and birthing the Holy. So it's a lovely oh, resource. Cool. Excellent. Well, I encourage everyone watching and listening today to check that out. Um, she has a plethora of, of resources, retreats, um, wonderful books that are all very worth reading. So um, Christine, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing some of your story. Um, we very much appreciate it. And we appreciate everyone for joining us and listening in. Yeah, thank you.